Welcome to the show, YouTubers. Smash like and subscribe as we prepare for the return of Europe's elite club competition. The Champions League returns with a bang tomorrow and an assortment of mouth-watering matchups involving Europe's biggest clubs, PSG host Juventus, Inter host Bayern Munich, Napoli host Liverpool, and that is just for starters. I'm Jonathan Johnson and I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by James Benj and Ian Paul Joy to pre preview the first round of games from the 22-23 group stage. Kego Lasso begins right now. <laughs> Welcome everybody to the show, James Benj. How are you doing? It's been a while since uh, since we crossed paths on here. <laughs> yeah, I'm I'm good. Yeah, you know, I managed to squeeze in a ill-timed vacation that took me off for uh, a whole round of Premier League fixtures and transfer deadline day. I mean, I say it was ill-timed. I think that was fantastically timed. Um, but it's good to be back, and certainly the next two months we're getting. There's no vacation time here at CBS. We are they're going to work us to the bone while we get through these Champions League games. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely was not envious of you uh, sunning yourself in Italy <laughs> while I was slogging away on the transfer deadline day. Ian, Paul Joy, how are you doing, my friend? Great to have you back on. I'm doing great, boys. It's wonderful to see both of you. Obviously, enjoy my time when we're together like a little family. CBS has given us the platform to share, obviously, great moments like this. And there are a few bigger than the Champions League. Getting ready for this Champions League campaign is going to be quite different. Obviously, a very compact schedule ahead of a World Cup. There's going to be, I think, a lot of surprise results this year. And I'm glad to share the journey with you, boys. Well, looking forward to it massively. And uh, you raise a very good point to start us off. So let's go with it straight off the bat. There is this compressed schedule because of the World Cup. Obviously, that means Champions League games are going to be coming thick and fast, which is fantastic. Uh, you know, if you're a neutral fan and your armchair, you know, being treated to all this fa fantastic high quality football week in, week out. But James, is there any risk that this is going to adversely affect the, the group stage of the Champions League and obviously beyond as well, because the knockout stage will take place after a draining World Cup for the players in Qatar. Well, I mean, like, you know, the, the, the schedule that, you know, world football has handed to these players and, you know, the players don't decide this, it is psychotic. Um, it is going to lead to some players getting really badly injured later in the season. I just, there's no doubt about that. Cause don't forget, you know, if you're an English team, you're fitting in league cup fixtures, left, right and center, you know, there'll be other cup competitions in, in other leagues. I think, you know, a team like Tottenham or, uh, don't have a free week before the or free, even a free midweek that isn't, you know, an international break or the world cup. Um, I mean, also I think, you know, when we look at this from a purely champions league perspective, we've basically lopped off about a month, of football um, playing those six games in a month less. If you're a team like Juventus that are coming into this with injuries to key players like Chiesa and Pogba, you know, that could be it. That could, uh, that could kill you right off. I mean, Ian, I'm sure you understand as a, as an ex pro much more, you know, what the strain on, on these players bodies would be like. And, you know, fascinated to get your view on that because it seems unmanageable. James, I could barely play 20 games a season without getting hurt. So never mind trying to fit in 40, 50 games a campaign. It's just, Ridiculous. You bring up a big point. Obviously, injuries are a concern. I think you're going to recognize that in the Champions League in particular, there's going to have to be like this big squad of players ready to go. If you don't have a big squad of players, you will struggle in the Champions League this campaign. What happens with injuries? Which players get injured is going to factor into who actually qualifies for the knockout stages. And then obviously ahead of a World Cup, I just wonder what's in the players' minds. I mean, you've got such a compact Champions League. It's the greatest club competition in the world. We've mentioned it so many times before. But then you've got a World Cup right around the corner where you're representing your country. Every player wants to be fit to be on that stage. So it's going to be interesting to see how the players handle this compact schedule. For me personally, um, I always think that these big-time players will get their minutes where they can rest in their domestic league. They'll take the Champions League very seriously. You'll see the strongest teams going out there until they're qualified for the knockout stage, and then they can start to rotate. So watch out for a lot of the big teams trying to get early victories in the group stage so that they can start to rest players ahead of the knockout stage. Yeah, absolutely. Makes uh, a lot of sense. Well, let's start with the champions, Real Madrid, because they'll be away against Celtic. That's a 
quite a you know a, a potential banana skin for for Real. I mean, we've seen them lose to the likes of Sheriff Shakhtar Donetsk, <laughs> uh, you know, in seasons gone by. Uh, you know, and this, I mean, okay, it's you know perhaps David against Goliath in many ways, but also at the same time, you know, this Celtic side under Ange Postecoglou. I mean, Ian, we were talking about it in the weekend roundup. Uh, you know, they are quite an underrated team, and also given that so many of their new talents now sort of come from outside of Europe, a lot of clubs are going to be discovering these players for the first time. Yeah, listen, a lot of these players will be in the shop window for a club like Celtic, and it is a massive club. Obviously, domestically, growing up in Scotland, following Rangers and Celtic very closely, you recognise how big these clubs are. It's pretty much everything in Scotland, Celtic or Rangers, and you either support one or the other, and if you support one of the, the, the other teams in the Scottish League or the Scottish Football League, you're a bit of a loser, right? But this is... <laughs> quite interesting to see a matchup like this after Celtic just absolutely hammered Rangers in the old farm. It's the great preparation. There was a slight concern about Furuhashi's injury, but it looks like Kyogo is going to be okay. He trained today with the team. Um, Starfelt is one player who came off in the old farm. It looks like he didn't train today. So whether he plays or not against Real Madrid will be interesting. So there might be rotation along the back line next to Carter Vickers. And um, I'll be interested to see if Kyogo, Kyogo actually starts because I thought Giacomakis did a great job when he came on to replace him. Abara, outstanding. This is a good Celtic side, and you make a great point. This is a Celtic side that's trying to prove a point. Ange Postacoglu also trying to prove a point. He wants Celtic to get it right in Europe. Domestically, it's a two-horse race. Against Rangers, they showed how powerful they can be. But when you step into the Champions League, there's an expectancy now from the Celtic fans because you're cleaning up domestically. Looks like they're probably going to be favourites to win the domestic title again. So now it's about Europe. And it's been a while since I have seen Celtic do very well in a group stage and then on to a knockout stage. And if they were to make the knockout stage and to obviously have success, even including against Real Madrid in a home game, it would be huge for Scottish football, huge for Glasgow Celtic, but we must not forget it's the champions, it's the holders, it's Real Madrid, the history coming to town. So easier said than done. Yeah, I mean, definitely easier said than done. But I think now's the time to play them, not least as, you, you know, the high of the old firm. That takes a long time to shake off in, in Glasgow. And maybe when we come to talk about Rangers, maybe that will be a bit of a hangover for them in their first game. But, you know, like you said, Ian, I love... How, what I love about this Celtic team is is it surprises you know anyone that that doesn't watch Scottish football regularly. Every time you see them, there's new, really talented players that they have triumphed in scouting and in recruitment and getting these players to the door. I mean, one I would highlight because maybe he doesn't get talked about enough south of the border, considering his talent, is Matt O'Reilly. You know, this was a guy that a few years back when he was at Fulham, top teams in in the Premier League in Europe were, were clambering over themselves to get at him. And then he, he kind of went off the radar quite a lot. And Celtic here have picked up a, a young midfielder with all the talents, all the raw attributes, I think to do well, even on the Champions League st stage. It's going to be tough. I've just been writing my, you know, column predicting on who, who the golden boot winner will be. And you can definitely see a world where Benzema starts filling his boots early on in games like this one. But, you know, Celtic Park back in the Champions League, back in the big time and with this historic traditional European game they'll be so up for it 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 will be tough for for Real Madrid just as it'll be tough for Celtic yeah I can vouch for the atmosphere at Celtic Park it's fantastic I've been there following PSG uh, a couple of years ago when Neymar Cavani uh, and Mbappe were making their Champions League bow together and it is it is a phenomenal atmosphere it can be very intimidating uh, ultimately PSG ran up nearly a cricket score but this is a much different Celtic side to the one that PSG mashed uh, back then and speaking of PSG Arguably, the big clash of the week comes at Parc des Princes. I'll be there tomorrow night. PSG against Juventus. It's a chance to see Galtier's new look PSG side uh, up against a Juve side with some familiar faces. Well, at least one because Leandro Paredes is in Massimiliano Allegri's group. Angel Di Maria won't be making an emotional return to Parc des Princes. Perhaps we'll see him over there in Italy. But I mean, surely there is no better time to be playing Juventus for, for PSG at this moment in time, Ian. No, it's a good time to play Juve because they're a rocky ship right now. Um, inconsistent. Obviously, they've made a bit of rotation ahead of this game. Left Vlahovic out at the weekend. He will most likely come straight back in. And, and he's the one, that, in my opinion, that Juve have got to rely on heavily. 
I think that Juventus are, are, are trying to figure some things out. There's no doubt that Allegri's under a lot of pressure there already from the media and clearly under pressure from his own supporters right now because Juventus fans, with the history they have, they expect, they want wins, they need wins. If they don't get wins, goodbye and on to the next one. It's also been very critical what they did in the transfer window. But I think there's still a good squad of players that Juventus have and it will cause problems for Paris Saint-Germain. But PSG are my favourites. I know you'll be happy to hear this, JJ, to make the final. I think this year, midfield is a lot better. Defensively, obviously needs to be consistent. That's where I thought they had big problems in the Champions League last year. But I think that they're a, a well-coached team now. Gautier is a, a wonderful coach. Obviously, got great history domestically and I'm intrigued to see how he does on this big stage with a big club, with big players. There's no doubt in my mind, if he gets the locker room right, and it looks like chemistry is kind of bouncing around right now, it's kind of exciting there in Paris. Fans are starting to believe again. They're starting to really trust the players. And um, I think you have to get off to a good start. So PSG have got to be favourites in this game. PSG go into this game looking to score goals, and I think they'll look to dominate this game. But the one key to success for Juve in my opinion, this whole season long in the Champions League, and even domestically, is Vlahovic. If he turns up, if he performs, if he shows us how good he can be or how good everyone is talking about him to be, if he's this world-class superstar, this is the platform he's got to turn up on. But I'm not sure I believe he's going to be able to do that. I kind of, going back to what you were saying, JJ, is this the tie of the week? I kind of, I tell you what, I mean, obviously, on paper, in terms of name, it is. You could not get me to watch this, though, because I have a really <laughs> strong feeling we're going to be watching 90 minutes of attacking drills from PSG against the Juventus team that, like, I was watching some clips from their game against Fiorentina, one shot on target that whole game. God, they were bad to watch. And, I mean, it's hard to shake the sense that knowing what we know about Allegri and how he's setting up in Serie A alone, like, this is going to be comeback, stick you know as many men behind the ball as we can and see if we can escape the park to prance with a, a point and like people will watch it will, maybe des will clip this up and you've you know people will come at me going well you know that's very unfair i mean allegri has said it, he doesn't he's not that bothered about the games against psg this is all about beating benfica like you know i really think that clearly psg are just going to try and uh, are going to spend a lot of the time trying to wear this Juventus defence down. I suspect they'll be successful, you know, better than me, JJ, but it, it seems like they've clicked into some sort of mood early in the season. And yeah, I mean, I I worry about Juve. I think if the, the players aren't back, if they're not fit and ready to go, next week they've got Benfica at home. Benfica look like they're in the mood to do something. You know, Juve need to come away from the Parc de Prance with a, a point. Otherwise, I think they're going to spend a lot of this group behind the eight ball. Yeah, I mean, you, you raise an interesting point because we're talking about this group from a PSG and Juventus perspective, but Benfica have really started in impressive form domestically and in terms of their qualification for the Champions League. They've picked up some interesting pieces as well. You've got Julian Draxler, who on his day, if he can get back to any semblance of form, can be a fine player. You've got John Anthony Brooks as well, who can be a solid option in defence as well, if he can find you know form and fitness. I mean, are we potentially looking at a big name crashing out. I mean, obviously, I know Agnelli will be bristling at the thought of Juve, you know, going out at the first hurdle. But, you know, th it, this does have the makings potentially of a, a very big name casualty early on, guys. Ian, what do you reckon? Yeah, I actually have them going out. I'm glad you bring up that Thanks. point, JJ, because they are a team, and, and James makes a great point here. Um, they're not the Juve of old. They're still trying to figure some things out. Watching Serie A and CBS has been awesome. And the guys have been very critical of Juventus, of the DNA of the football club. If you think about Juventus, most of the players who play for Juve, who even have the opportunity ever to represent that football club, they live and breathe that football club. But the diehards of Juve are pretty much no longer there. Now it's about trying to put a team on that can compete in the Champions League. And this is a big game to start. I mean, it's a crazy game for them to go and start um, their, camp their Champions League campaign. I think that Benfica, you make a great point. They have brought in some excellent players. I love Roger Schmidt. One of my favorite coaches, obviously, has uh, is got a big task at hand here to try and finish second in the group. There's no doubt it's a battle for second place. Obviously, the fixtures are going to come into place. But I think that 
Benfica are teed up to really go and knock Juve out here. And I don't think Juventus are going to be the only club, the only big club with great history who gets knocked out in the group stage. And it's not just because of them having a maybe a poor or not a great transfer period, losing some big players. Coach struggled domestically trying to find consistency in the domestic league to start it. I think it's also down to the fact that this compact schedule of games where you're trying to compete in multiple competitions, then also play games for your international club or uh, country ahead of a World Cup. There's a lot on these players' minds right now. And if you don't have the right team, if you don't have the chemistry, if you don't have the right connection with your coach and the right bench available to you, you're going out. And you have proven already, as James rightfully pointed out, they're struggling to even dominate games nowadays. The only thing I'd want to add on Group H, I am so excited to see this Enzo Fernandez kid. His stats, I know this is, we have to say, this is from Argentina mostly. His stats are mind-boggling. This is a player that's sort of the best defensive midfielder in the in Argentina and also the best ball progressor. And he's got a decent shot on him as well. Um, if we're kind of looking for, you know, the, the potential breakout stars of this tournament, uh, they ch- tend to come from either Benfica or Red Bull Salzburg. Uh, Salzburg have got a few as well, but Fernandez is one that I think could be on his way to England sooner than later and for an awful lot of money at that. Well, we'll keep an eye on him. And now we'll turn our attentions to another uh, clash of, you know, two clubs with, uh, you know, substantial recent history on the on the European stage. Uh, but it's an interesting one because you had Steven Gerrard going into this clash with Manchester City at the weekend with Aston Villa under pressure, got uh, a draw, which, you know, keeps him in his job for now. You've got Yulen Lopetegui coming into this one with Sevilla off the back of an absolute hiding from Barcelona. And it really feels like a tall task to say that this is sort of a, a must-win game for him uh, in order to, to save his job. But I mean, I I feel like every single podcast episode, I've been really down on Sevilla since even before the season started. But I kind of feel like every time I see them in action week in, week out at the moment, it it justifies that they just feel very journeyman like. I mean, there, there are a couple of potential gems in that squad, but they've been snapped up by Sevilla at bargain prices for a reason because they haven't been getting the games, the time that they need over the last couple of years. When you look at the likes of Tongi Kressi in uh, in defense, it's going to take a while to bring somebody like him to anywhere close to the level of a Diego Carlos uh, and Jules Koundé, who obviously showed his best against his former club for Barca over the weekend. So, you know, this one for me really has the the feelings of potentially City giving, uh, you know, Sevilla and uh, an absolute pasting. What do you, what do you think about it, James? Yeah, it's a paddling written all over. I mean, every everything we say, I'm now convinced it'll be nil-nil, but it's got paddling written all over it. Erling Haaland, 23 goals in 19 Champions League games. And hey, we all thought it would take time to adjust them. We were all wrong. Like he just he's clicked. And no one, I I I have I mean, Ian, I'd be fascinated to know how on earth you would go about defending uh, against him because I just don't know how you stop this guy. He's always running, always stretching your defence. And when City are, are looking for space in front of you as well, I mean, God, I just feel really sorry for the severe defenders who've got to come up against him in his favourite competition as well. James, were you one of the ones that predicted he would struggle in the Premier League? I thought it would take a little while just for... Ev- I thought it'd take a little while for everything to get on the same wavelength. I was wrong because in the end, you know, I think we all, I, I, with Dortmund, there was so much space, wasn't there, in behind for him to operate in the nature of the Bundesliga. And I thought, well, he's going to miss that. But actually, it turns out he doesn't need it. He's so quick and so strong. He only needs sort of a millimeter. I thought it was really apparent against West Ham, which was the game I watched him the most closely on, on debut, that if that defensive line isn't perfect, he will exploit it. So, uh, yeah, I, I thought he'd struggle, and I'm pretty certain I got that one wrong. No, listen, you're not the only one who got that one wrong when predicting how good Erling Haaland is or how well he would um, settle into the Premier League. I had a great discussion with Jimmy Conrad and Luis Garcia, um, who obviously played so many games in the Premier League for Liverpool, also won the Champions League with Liverpool. And, and Luis also predicted that Erling Haaland would struggle to get oh, good to know a I'm not large mad. number of goals. You're not mad. You're not mad. Many, many did. And, and if you're listening to podcasts around the world, if you're listening to radio talk shows um, and debate shows, most people who follow the Premier League regularly will say 
that he would have struggled. But fortunately, obviously, I, I follow the Bundesliga very closely, and I've actually followed this kid his whole career very closely, even um, for his national team, uh, uh, youth World Cups and youth championships before stepping into the big stage. And the guy's an animal. He's something I've never seen before. If you, you only have to look at the size of him, the stature, the frame of him, the size of his body, how tall he is, how, how powerful and the presence that he has. But he backs it up with goals. Now, just a few stats. You touched upon the 23 goals that he scored in the 19 Champions League games. For Borussia Dortmund, he got 86 goals and 89 appearances. Salzburg, 29 goals and 27 appearances. And for Manchester City, I believe it's 10 goals in the seven appearances he's had so far. Now, these numbers are something I've never seen before. Maybe if you go back to a Pelé or someone like that who scores goals in, in dramatic fashion... These numbers are something different. He's a mold of Thierry Henry with his pace, the way he loves to get forward, the way he puts himself into goal-scoring positions. He's a finisher like Alan Shearer because he's an absolute killer inside the penalty box. Um, and, and he has this power and this presence and this stature of an absolute killer inside the penalty box of any proven goal scorer like an Andy Cole or a Dwight York, someone who's proven to be scoring goals in the Premier League. This guy has it all. And the Champions League is just another competition to him. It's not as if he goes into the Champions League thinking, oh, I might struggle here because it's a little bit different. This is a competition that he will thrive upon because Manchester City will dominate. They're my favourites to go all the way and win it this year. And the reason they're my favourites to go and win it this year is because they handpicked Erling Haaland at a cheap price and they've given him all the tools. Every single player around, and this is where people got it wrong with Erling Haaland, Every single player for Manchester City right now are not playing for themselves. They're playing for Manchester City Football Club to win trophies. And they know, they recognize that Erling Haaland is that missing piece to success on the European stage as much as it is domestically. Because this guy has it all. So there's no doubt in my mind this game is going to be a difficult game. I can see City scoring another four or five. I loved your Thierry Henry comp, Larry, and because I think one of the things that, that makes it so hard to 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 get Haaland early on is we have never seen a footballer like him. I, you know, this is to me he's like Kevin Durant, Durant in the NBA, a player that size. You know, this is Peter Crouch's height, but as you said, like Thierry Henry levels of pace, incision, finishing. I ha- I have never seen that in a in a top tier a top tier striker is Peter Crouch with the, with the skills of Thierry Henry. It's, it's magical. You know, it is the future. Like, you know, like they say in the NBA, when you can teach those big, big men, the skills of a guard, it is, this is something that you just can't defend against. I don't know how you go and stop Haaland at all. No. And, and, and if I can throw another name into you before JJ jumps in, he is, probably as aggressive and he has the attitude of a Zlatan. He's as flexible, the way he moves, the aggression he has. And and you guys know, obviously, working in the soccer media world, he's a difficult interviewer as well because he's cocky, he's arrogant. He has, he has all the arrogance that you could possibly want for a player who knows how freaking good he is. You know what? You've just spoiled uh, the last point that I was going to finish up on. So this podcast getting far too agreeable for my liking. But no, the, the <laughs> point on Zlatan is really good because Zlatan, when he came to PSG, he was so dominant in the gun. Unfortunately, we didn't quite see it translate onto the European uh, scene. I mean, you know, he was that dominant to a point for PSG sort of up until the quarterfinals. But, you know, Haaland is already beyond that. It's almost like you took away that bit of creativity that Zlatan has in his game and you just put it purely into the finishing with Haaland. You know, you don't expect too much from him in terms of sort of laying on assists. He's just there to finish absolutely everything uh, that comes his way. And, you know, he is a terrifying prospect. The only thing, uh, you know, that I will say, uh, you know, is that he perhaps, you know, won't, come up against the likes of Tyro Mings week in, week out, because we all know how he got slightly silenced at Villa Park over the weekend. That's uh, me clutching (laughs) at straws for something positive about Villa. But anyway, moving it on swiftly to the rest of Tuesday's action, you've got Milan and Chelsea on the road. But sticking on the topic uh, of managers under pressure, you've also got Domenico Tedesco, who's feeling the heat from the hot seat uh, at Leipzig at this moment in time. Obviously, an unexpected 
thrashing at the hands of Eintracht Frankfurt over the weekend. What's going on in Leipzig, Ian? And, you know, are we potentially looking at another manager or casualty early doors? Because Fabrizio Romano also mentioned this to me earlier today that I should keep an eye on the, the Leipzig coach position. Yeah, I'm glad you're giving us the inside scoop and that's what we should be doing week in and week out, bringing these inside scoops, all the information that people don't know about. Absolutely he's on the hot seat. I mean, it's not it's consistency that's a big problem for Leipzig. They sold some big time players, some leaders. They had um, obviously a bit of quality that was on the bench that wanted to play. Um, bringing in Domenico Tedesco, it was a gamble because he's a, a, a young coach who's trying to prove himself. But this is um, an embarrassing time for them right now. They, I think, will really struggle this year. I think they're going to really, really struggle. I mean, they struggled last year, but I think they'll even struggle to pick up maybe more than six points in the group stage. You obviously have the Shakhtar games, which you can look forward to playing because it's a changed Shakhtar side. There's no more Brazilians there. It's a lot of domestic players and their um, home games, it looks like they'll be played in Poland, if I'm not mistaken. It's a tough group for them. So, I think it's going to be interesting to see how well they will do. Um, there's no doubt that they need to get off to a good start. They're lucky that they have Shakhtar in that opening game. But Leipzig are in a mess right now. They do have Christopher Nkunku. They signed him to a longer-term contract, and that was a great bit of business. But that's probably only just to guarantee that they get a big price tag for him. And I don't see a player of his quality hanging around for too long. But if he has a Champions League campaign like he did last year where he was scoring goals, his price tag could go even higher. James, I'll let you hit on uh, Zagreb Chelsea to finish it off. I'm sure that the Zagreb Tourism Authority are bristling at the thought of you, uh, you know, having another comment on uh, their <laughs> attractivity to travelling fans. It's just, it's just not, uh, it's no split and no uh, Dubrovnik, but it is, <laughs> it's nice. It's an, I, I went to a museum called the Museum of Broken Relationships, uh, and on the subject of broken relationships. That was a quite a nice segue. There. It was um, that was a brilliant I, segue. And and struggling managers. Uh, Thomas Tuchel. I, I hope I hope you're gonna I hope you're gonna link Tuchel with Leipzig just to finish this all off, tie it off in a nice book. <laughs> well, I, I certainly think I have a sneaking feeling that things might be about to get a little bit more complicated for Thomas Tuchel at the Ma Maximir Stadium, which, as we know graveyard of many an English team, Arsenal, Tottenham, have lost there in recent years. Right now, Chelsea, kind of as we speak, I think they've just confirmed that Thiago Silva and N'Golo Conte will not be travelling to Zagreb. It's a tough place to go. Uh, Zagreb have hit a lot of form. Great front line. Uh, Marco uh, Mislav Orsic, one player to watch out for as well, Marco Bullat. And that's why I've got this down as a Dinamo Zagreb win, you know. I think Zagreb are going to upset the apple cart Chelsea can't defend set pieces uh Chelsea look a bit all at sea so yeah I've actually gone and done in my written prediction I think Zagreb are going to to uh I think Zagreb are going to edge this one whoa whoa I mean I think there's going to be a few surprise results but that would be one heck of a result you're right it's a difficult place to go play um but this is a, a game where realistically Thomas Tuchel needs to do well here. Otherwise, the pressure he's under or whatever is going on at a football club will intensify because of people like us talking about him more in the situation at Chelsea more. Team selection, players being unhappy, whatever it may be. There'll be a lot of noise if it doesn't happen. I watched the Dinamo Zagreb qualifier game getting in there. They left it very late, took it to extra time. Um, obviously relied on some experienced players to get them through. They do have Petkovic, who's a, a, a nice player, obviously an international player as well. Orsic, you already touched upon. Superb player, had a great start to the season it's going to be a tough game you're absolutely right I find it hard to believe that Chelsea will lose that game though Interesting. Well, I'm in a sticky situation where I'm now having to defend Thomas Tuchel after saying last week that there's no such thing as no more excuses left in the Thomas Tuchel playbook. <laughs> I actually find that he's at his best when he's got his back against the wall. So maybe maybe Tuchel will provide some sort of response here. We'll have to wait and see. I normally find that he's better when he's got his hands tied in terms of personnel. So James mentioning Thiago Silva and Golo Conte being out. Very, very interesting. We are going to take a quick break and then we'll be back for more Champions League goodness. 
CBS Sports is your home for the 2022-23 UEFA Champions League, UEFA Europa League and UEFA Europa Conference League group stages with Paramount Plus streaming every match live. And to complement the best club competitions in the world, Paramount Plus also boasts a wealth of premium soccer documentaries, including Destination Paris, which premieres exclusively in the US on September the 6th and follows journalist Guillaume Balaguer's path through Europe for the 2021 20 22 UEFA Champions League season, culminating with the final in the French capital. Balaguer's travels detail Ukrainian club Shakhtar Donetsk's experiences amid an ongoing war. So check out Destination Paris and the entire Champions League season on Paramount+. Plus. Welcome back, everybody. Well, we'll look ahead to the Wednesday clashes now in slightly less detail than the Tuesday ones, because I'm sure we will touch on them again in Tuesday's roundup. But first of all, it's difficult to look beyond on this one, Inter Milan versus Bayern Munich. And Ian, your suggestion that Bayern were going to find it difficult in the Champions League this season is not looking so daft after all, given Bayern's couple of recent results where they you know, haven't quite looked as dominant as people expected them to in the Bundesliga. Yeah, thanks very much for backing me up there, JJ, because not many people would probably back me up on the prediction that Bayern Munich will struggle in the group stage. Listen, this first game, is a cup final for Bayern Munich. Because if they win the game, and of course, I still believe they're favourites to, to get out of the group. And it's absolutely ridiculous for me to say that Bayern Munich will not get out the group stage this season on the Champions League. But it's just an idea and a thought that I can't get rid of in my head. I, I want Bayern Munich to have success in the Champions League. I want Bayern Munich to get out the group stage and be dangerous in the knockout stage. There's no doubt about it. But... The way this group was shaping up, I could start to see, uh-oh, this is going to be a difficult one because you have the history, obviously, with the Barcelona and now Lewandowski there, who's left Bayern Munich, who was their pretty much guaranteed goal scorer in the Champions League to help them get to the knockout stage. You have an easy one against Victoria Pilsen, who are just happy to play a role. But then you've got a difficult one against an Inter Milan side who are unpredictable. We don't know how good they are. And the Derby didn't look that good. Defensively, pretty poor. They defend like that against Bayern Munich, they'll probably lose that game. So I think that the defeat in the derby against Milan means that Inter will be different. They'll be more focused. They'll be more determined. Um, it'll be interesting to see who's healthy to go in that game because I think Inter with their best players will, will cause a lot of problems for Bayern. But this is a tough game for Bayern Munich. Not too many injury concerns to worry about for Nagelsmann. Um, but after the weekend's result where they now currently sit third in the Bundesliga, there's pressure. If you're not top of the table and your name is Bayern Munich, the media are all over you. Immediately, there's talk about the, the, the hot seat for Nagelsmann. How successful is he? Was it the right move to get rid of Lewandowski? Everything comes into question. And if he loses this game or if he doesn't win this first game, that pressure is going to intensify. And that's where I think because of this compact Champions League campaign, that's where I think Bayern could really struggle. Yeah, it's. I, I don't know. I can't quite get there with you, Ian. But obviously, you know the the Bundesliga far better than me. I just wonder. You know, is any goalkeeper going to have a performance quite as good as as Jan Sommer had? Was it nineteen saves, something like that? And I I feel very <laughs> confident that. I mean, but then that's the interesting thing about this Nagelsmann style Bayern is there's something especially post Lewandowski, it feels like there's something about them where they could waste a lot of chances or they could, they, they, they seem to run into goalkeepers in good form. Now, maybe that's just coincidence. You know, when you make the level of chances that a buy and do, you tend to, to win a lot of games. I don't know. Is there kind of, what's your view on the sort of suggestion that, that Nagelsmann just makes things a bit too complicated. He makes it all quite fiddly and, Ta you know, tactically advanced when sometimes you just think stick this, your best this, this, sound, this sounds a lot like somebody who sits on the bench of a team that wears sky blue and normally gets to the latter stage of the Champions League before <laughs> crashing out unexpectedly. <laughs> He's got a lot Listen, more. I'll jump, in, I'll jump in real quickly and I'll tell you that they do create a lot of chances. They absolutely do. They have come up against some top-class goalkeeping performances, even at the weekend against Union Berlin, who mm. are flying high themselves in the Bundesliga. They're having a great campaign, or at least a great start. But it's also, to both of you, this is, it's also about that finisher. 
You take a Lewandowski away from this Bayern Munich side, you take him away from any side, you're going to see a drop in finishing. You're going to see a drop in the numbers. Unless you replace him with a killer, it's impossible to think that Bayern will score as many goals as they did when they had Lewandowski. It was a guaranteed double figures and goals in the Champions League with Levy. Now he's gone. Watch Barcelona. It's a guaranteed double figure in goals for Lewandowski at Barca. So I think that Bayern, even though everyone keeps telling me they're going to spread the goals around, they've got talent. Obviously, Sadio Mane's come in. He's a wonderful player. He'll do well in the Champions League. It's not that easy. This is the biggest and best club competition in the world, and you've got to be on your A game. You've got to take your chances because you won't get 21, 25 chances in a game. You've got to take that one or two that you get in the first half to win games. So... That's where I think they'll struggle. And, and Nagelsmann is, is an arrogant person as well, by the way. He is the one who believes in himself. He's cocky. He took this position under a bit of pressure. Um, I think you'll see him in the Premier League one day. That's, that's for sure. And his English is excellent as well, so you both know. But I think he's struggling right now with the loss of a killer goal scorer in a big way. That's really interesting because when I look at this Bayern side, and I've said it before and I know I've come in for a bit of flack, especially as I'm sort of targeting the the Frenchies who I know very well, uh, you know, in terms of their game, both with, uh, you know, for club and country. But I feel that it Bayern's back line is still very, very unconvincing. Upper Meccano, Hernandez, Benjamin Pavard. I mean, I know Pavard played a, a worldy pass the other day to to, to, to play in, uh, you know, I think it was Mane for one of the chances. But other than that, you know, I think defensively, there are a lot of questions about this Bayern side. And you look at some of the games they've had so far, James rightly pointing out that you're not going to come up against a goalkeeper in the form of Jan Zoma like that, uh, you know, week in, week out. So they were still creating enough opportunities to score. I feel that Bayern's biggest weakness, and I don't know if you if you agree or disagree with this, Ian, is that they look more like conceding goals than they ever have over the last sort of five years, uh, you know, th this last season or so. I feel that they've always looked vulnerable, uh, you know, and that's at the end of the day what has cost them against the likes of Villarreal, uh, you know, in the past because, you know, they just can't keep those goals out. Yeah, that's a great point. And that's the big talking point about Bayern Munich. If you are a betting person out there, you can make a lot of money on Bayern Munich conceding that first goal and playing from 1-0 behind. It's happened so many times domestically uh, and also in the Champions League where they've found themselves behind and they're chasing the game and then they score three or four. Now they don't have that goal scorer anymore. Those battles from behind are becoming more and more difficult. I think you're right. I mean, obviously, there's an amazing amount of talent that they have defensively. Um, the names that you ring up, we, we know they've spent a bit of money defensively. Obviously, Upamecano um, has struggled since he's arrived there. You can sense that. Um, but it's not easy for him when you keep on changing his partnership, whether it's Sule, whether it's Delit or whoever it is that's playing alongside him. Defensively, they'll struggle. So if you're a betting person out there, watch out for Bayern Munich conceding that first goal. All right, well, we're in a situation now where it feels really strange to talk about one of the teams, aside from Nottingham Forest, who was busiest on the summer transfer window, being something of a wild card in this Champions League group. But that's where we're at with uh, this Barcelona side at this moment in time. Uh, they opened their uh, Champions League campaign against Victoria Pilsen. We've already established that we're not expecting them to do much apart from enjoy pretty much every away day uh, and be, you know, very excellent hosts uh you know when people are visiting them in the czech republic but james bench i mean are barca you know quietly kind of favorites for this group right now no no but they're just i mean i you've, you've really talked you've all talked me out of, of bayern munich who i kind of have as one of the favorites for the whole tournament outright or certainly did before those two wobbles i just you're welcome <laughs> I think in the end, you know, with, I, I really like Inter. And I think if they get out of the group, they actually have a very good chance of, of making a real ruckus in this competition. With Barcelona, you just have, when you look at teams that have, have un, undertaken the sort of radical overhaul that, that Barcelona have, you kind of need to separate how they look on paper from how, you know, what can be expected of them a few weeks into a new era. I still find that, you know, they can often be too reliant on Pedri. Um, for the for the creativity for getting them up the pitch that defense is going to need time to gel the players there are unquestionably talented but i think they like a juventus they could be at a disadvantage based on the fact that they do not have time 
to bring this all together. They don't, Xavi is not going to have a lot of time on the training pitch to settle these players into their roles. I could be wrong, but I actually have them as the one of the three that, that ends up in the Europa League. No, you are wrong, James. Don't worry about it. You are wrong about that. <laughs> Barcelona, Barcelona will win the group. They will win the group. I really believe it. I think they're so well coached now. I mean, when you have Xavi on the sidelines and pulling the strings in a locker room where he's getting the right characters, getting the right experience. I mean, the Lewandowski um, transfer for me was just world-class. And how on earth they managed to get a player like him to leave Bayern Munich is just sensational. He guarantees you goals. And obviously, when you're playing up against a Pilsen for your first game, he might get a hat-trick in his first game. He might score more than it. You never know because they're going to create so many chances. But they have made some incredible signings. Obviously, it'll be interesting to see down the line the financial fair play as to how they made these transfers. Um, and obviously, it's going to be interesting to see how they gel together as a team. But I think that this is a perfect mix of youth. They've got some experience on the bench who um, have tremendous history in this competition, pushing these youngsters and new signings. Spent a lot of money on bringing in Akunde, who had a terrific performance at the weekend. Um, will most likely start again. They have got a very good midfield, some youngsters with an, a great and experienced Busquets. They've got a life of luxury Full right now. The they've, but they've got bad. a life of luxury, though, James. They, they've got 11 and then another mm. 11 who can come in. So they've got quality and depth. They can rotate. They don't have to just play an 11 domestically and uh, that same 11 in the Champions League. They can rotate players using the experience they have and some of the youngsters. I agree with you on the fullbacks, but I still, I still think that they are the team to beat in this group. Uh, some very interesting points raised by you both. Well, as to James's point, we'll be keeping an eye on the pint-sized Pedri in Pilsen. I hope you like what I did there. <laughs> and uh, also with, uh, with with Barca, just one final parting thought that I'd add to it. I am very surprised um, at the way that they've kind of hit the ground running in La Liga in terms of some of the results they've picked up. Had a very slow start in the first game, but you, you, know, you wouldn't expect them to have run up those kind of scores against Sociedad and Sevilla a couple of weeks ago. So definitely one to watch uh, and see how that Champions League group is looking after perhaps two or three rounds of matches. Let's move it on. Uh, a tough opening game for Liverpool, James Ben, Joao and Napoli. What are you expecting from this one? Napoli, you know, a fantastic place to to go and visit on the on the on the Champions League roadmap. Yeah, I mean, you have to make Liverpool favourites for sure because this team has been one of the best in Europe over the last few years, consistently in the closing stages of the competition. But you know, there is something up. I don't think we are kind of looking at the struggles of a few years ago, but really, this Liverpool side in midfield. It, it, it's not clicking. I think Harvey Elliott has been wonderful as an addition, but he's a he's a number ten, and Liverpool are not used to playing a sort of four two three one. This is a four three three team. Fabinho, obviously, he's not entirely you know convincing Klopp at the moment, and he was rested. And but they look a shadow of the team without him. Jordan Henderson is is struggling, and then of course you have all these injuries to players that you kind of have to factor in injuries for. You know the likes of Naby Keita. Alex Oxlade Chamberlain. Oh, no, no, Kita not even on the list. Is it no? Is he not? I, I totally no, missed that. Oxlade but it doesn't Chamberlain surprise me also because, left out. Well, Oxlade Chamberlain is not really of the standard that he <laughs> that he could have been, um, and that he looked like being for a little while under Klopp. Um, but that's it. You know, it's not a, a deep midfield if two of these players you you can't rely on to be fit at the very least. Um, Curtis Jones as well is another that seems to be struggling with injuries. Kind of for that reason, it's it's going to be really tough because I think. You had this machine that that functioned beautifully. You know, Alexander Arnold could go forward, but he could trust that there would be a midfielder, often Henderson, plugging the gaps for him. But Henderson, his positioning this season, I think, so often looks askew. Um, and I think when one or two parts of this engine start to to falter, the, the team as a whole really starts struggling. You know, you have the same at the top of the pitch. They're missing Mane. Salah's having to carry a lot more of the creative burden. I think his expected assists have absolutely shot up, but his expected goals have, have kind of gone through the floor by his own very high standards. So this is a really tough time to be playing your first big game and your, and your toughest game of the group stages. I think they will just about have enough, but this is one to put on your upset watch list for certain and Kavara Donna, 
we're going to be seeing a lot more of him in the next few months. <laughs> <laughs> I love that, I by the way. I made Madonna, didn't feel I? Because <laughs> we, it's a lot easier than... I can't wait to see you guys try and take on his actual name. Give that one to me. No, Kvaratskhelia. Kvaratskhelia. I'm just guessing. But I think it's uh, somewhere close to that. It, it, what a player he's been for them so far. I mean, what a great introduction it's been for him to Napoli, a, a great club with great tradition. And JJ, you pointed it out. It's a great place to go play for Liverpool. It's a tough place to go play. And uh, James, you're right. I think this one's going to be a hard one for Liverpool, just trying to figure it out. Unbeaten, obviously, sitting top of Serie A. Um, they're a good side. They're the high school scorers in Serie A to start the campaign. They've got off to this terrific start. However, Liverpool is a different animal, and I agree with you. Something's not quite right there, but this is the competition where I would expect Liverpool to get it right. They're still my favourites to finish top of the group. I find it hard to say that Liverpool won't score in Naples. I think they will score. Um, I think that Napoli will be dangerous. Um, they have a, a very good squad of players who can compete. But are they good enough to compete against this Liverpool side? If you look at the quality that Liverpool do possess, and I do understand there is some defensive worries as well, I think it's going to be an interesting game. I can see a draw in this game. I don't think Liverpool will lose this game. I'd love to see Napoli get that first goal to make it a real good watch, though. If Napoli get the first goal, it could be a real entertaining matchup because then we're going to find out a lot about this Liverpool side. But you're both very right. Obviously, James, perfect point about... Liverpool right now. Something not quite right. And I saw a great stat before I, I stop here about Jurgen Klopp in his seventh year at a club. He struggled in years in his seventh year, believe it or not, at a club, um, both at Mainz and also at Borussia Dortmund. He struggled in his seventh year. So how will it be for him this year? It's going to be hard. Well, Steven Gerrard, stop finding those points with Aston Villa because your dream job opening could be closer than you think it is. While well, moving on to another Premier League team that will be opening their Champions League campaign this midweek, Tottenham against Marseille. Now, this one is intriguing because I didn't have OM down to be starting the league on season the way that they have. It looked like they were in disarray when Igor Tudor came through the door and suddenly players were up in arms that somebody was trying to light a fire under them and get some you know, reaction to get them to give more than they had already given last season managing to finish second to get back in the Champions League fell short in the Europa Conference League uh, but you know this one I mean I have a good feeling about Spurs in the Champions League I don't know how you're feeling about it James but it also has the makings of being potentially a tricky one because on paper Spurs overwhelming favorites but if this is really a different Marseille to the ones that we've seen sort of get embarrassed on the Champions League stage in the last couple of years it could be a bit tougher than many are expecting yes and it certainly helps from a, a Marseille perspective that they're rolling out all these <laughs> current or former Arsenal players who are definitely all going to want to have a point to prove in North London. Uh, Matteo Guendouzi rarely needs much of an excuse, does he, to uh, to rile himself <laughs> up and uh, earn a foolish yellow a, pl card. a player after your own heart, Ian. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what a player he is, though. I think he's fantastic. Um, but I think Tottenham are... Oh, you. you I mean, it's, you know, it's Antonio Conte and Tottenham in the Champions League. It's easy to make a sort of reactionary case against them. But this squad is is really talented. Going back to what Ian was saying at the top of the show, you need depth to really compete in this competition. And, and Spurs have it, you know, we're seeing in so many positions. You know, somewhere like left wing back, even per Ivan Perisic is kind of having a fight for his position because Ryan Sessegnon has become the player we all thought he would be one day. Most notably of all, you could make a case. I wouldn't agree with you, but you could make a case for dropping Hyung Min Son. One assist so far this season, and Richarlison, Dejan Kulisevsky are lighting it up. You know, Tottenham have this this strength in depth that I think they can really make pay in this competition. And while there are absolutely no easy games in their particular group, I also think that they should be considered favourites in pretty much every game. And I, I have a little feeling that this group may be more comfortable for Tottenham than than many would expect a Tottenham-Antonio-Conte combo to make the Champions League look. 
Yeah, it's a tough group. It's a tough group to predict. I'm really intrigued to hear you, JJ, um, give me who you think is going to actually come out of this group, whether it will be a Frankfurt or a Marseille who finishes either second or, or challenges Tottenham to get out. But then you throw in a sport in Lisbon, and it's going to be an amazing group. I mean, this is really a group of death that not many people are talking about. I mean, the moves that Marseille have made make this fixture a mouthwatering game. I think this will be a really difficult game for Spurs. I really believe that. I've obviously got my one eye on, on Frankfurt. I want to see them do well in this group. They, they're starting to get things going there, so they're going to shake up a few things. But in my opinion, Tottenham and Marseille are the two favourites to get out of this group. Um, when you have, obviously, goal scorers like Tottenham have and they've, and they've spent a bit of money and they've brought in real quality, I love your point about Son and, and you can make this debate as to whether or not he should spend some time on the bench and there should be a rotation in there. I really love what Kulazevki brings to, to Spurs. I mean, just an outstanding addition to this team. Um, but Harry Kane is the goal scorer. If the guy uh, finds his form, Tottenham should finish top of this group. But I think they'll have a fight on their hands in this first game because Marseille are in form. They've made some incredible signings. I think you'll see a better Marseille than we have seen in recent years in European competition. And um, there's no doubt that this first game, they'll recognize if they get a point from this game or potentially shake everything up, they could go ahead and win the group. Yeah, for me, I mean, I, I find this one really curious, especially based on uh, Frankfurt's recent win over Leipzig, because Frankfurt didn't look that convincing at the beginning of the season. I said uh, in advance that I thought Kolo Moani would be an excellent capture for them. He has really hit the ground running with them. I think he's a, an excellent talent. Sporting, I mean, sporting are the kind of team that I always expect to sort of be challenging to perhaps sneak through in the group stage, but then drop out just immediately once you get into the into the knockout phases. But also, you know, let's not forget, you know, this is an Eintracht Frankfurt side that won the Europa League last season, won at the expense of Rangers. You know, I could uh, lead us into talking about Atleti Porto next, but I kind of feel like that is just that group had Atletico Madrid written all over it. But Rangers Ajax, for me, uh, you know, leading on from uh, talking about Eintracht is that that is a really curious fixture for me ahead of uh, ahead of Wednesday, because this is an Ajax side that's been absolutely pillaged uh, of all talent. This transfer window, we saw Anthony moving to Manchester United, late doors. Is, is this the end of, uh, you know, Ajax's time in the sun on the European stage, James, where it feels like, you know, they've sort of been everyone's dark horses for the last couple of years. And then they sort of fell on their faces spectacularly to pretty much everybody's <laughs> surprise except you, because I think you were the only person I know who called them uh, getting found out. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I think you're very generous to say that. I, I think I was the one saying they might win the whole thing last season, or at the very least be a semi-finalist. I, I love that team, and, and I think actually European football should just once, next time Ajax get a good team, just give them a couple of years, let them enjoy themselves. I don't know what to make. I, I have no, literally no idea, because yes, they're, they're five wins from five in the Eredivisie, but I think you know they've they played Königen, Utrecht, it's not, they've not even, we've not even seen them against a PSV or a, or a Feyenoord yet to, to kind of make the judgment call on them. Players are good though, and you have to trust, you have to trust Ajax's recruitment because they, they've done this before and they've done it successfully. I, Ajax, Ajax's recruitment who decided they didn't want a Campos while he was midair, like flying into uh, Amsterdam <laughs> in the final day of the transfer window while you were on holiday. <laughs> well, I mean, they've got to do some of this stuff on the fly, haven't they? When someone's giving you 100 million euros for Anthony, you've got to kind of work stuff out there. I mean, I don't know why they didn't just like kind of, what's what's Neymar's buyout clause or Messi's? Surely they've got enough money now to, to afford <laughs> those. Um, I I think it certainly it will help them that they're not away to Rangers and, and away in Ibrox. I'm really excited though also to see, you know, we talk about, and I talk about Ajax's recruitment. Look at some of the players that Rangers have added to this squad. Um, in particular, a bit of shout out for our, our future US star. Malik Tillman was wonderful in getting Rangers this far. And that is a huge achievement. I think it may well be kind of the limits of what Rangers do in Europe this season. But I mean, I also wouldn't rule anything out with this team, with that uh, Ibrox atmosphere. And um, I am really excited to see to see Tillman. He looks a, a proper player and and one that, maybe Bayern Munich might find themselves wanting to bring back pretty soon. I really like him. He's really good. 
Yeah, it's cool to see all the American players who are involved in the Champions League this campaign, including, obviously, Malik Tillman, who, you're right, it's a great addition for Rangers. It's a good bit of business for them. Obviously, um, they're giving him a platform to play in the Champions League, which is what a kid like him should be doing. He's clearly at that level. thought he was found out a little bit in the old firm this past game. I thought Rangers were found out defensively in the old firm. So not great preparation ahead of this game against Ajax, but they've... They've also kind of tried to deal with some discipline issues with Morelos. They've had Cholak doing well and brought him in. He's been a real good addition to the club. Mm. But they rely on what Ryan Kent does pretty much every game, his pace, trying to take players on. What Tavernier does, obviously he's a right fullback, but he's not really because he's pretty much as good an assist man or goal scorer as any player you'll see in European football. So the Rangers will be dangerous. It's not an easy game for Ajax, and I agree with both of you. This is going to be a test for Ajax Amsterdam, and we'll find out exactly how good they are but I do like them as a business they continue to produce players the rest of the world is living off of IX talent another 200 million they brought in from, from sales it's a phenomenal business what they do in Amsterdam is incredible so that game is going to be a cracking game to watch and obviously both of those teams are fighting are really desperate and are hoping and praying that they can finish either second in the group and just bring a surprise on the other two. Yeah, some fantastic stuff to look forward to this midweek as the Champions League come back. So we'll get some final thoughts in a minute. But first of all, thanks so much for listening to Kigo Lasso. Please take a minute to leave us a rating review on your favorite podcast platform. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, anywhere you listen to podcasts. We're also available as video. Subscribe to us on YouTube and visit us there. James Benj, final thoughts before the Champions League gets back underway. Oh, it's just going to be, this is going to be a very special, very unpredictable, very weird Champions League. I have a little feeling that come the end of, I mean, it's, we all say this and then we end up with loads of teams from England, Italy, Spain and and Germany. But I have half a feeling this might be a year that we at least see one or two more surprises than usual, just the nature of it. It's going to be really fun and uh, I can't wait to follow it with you guys. Yeah, and I Ian. think you'll see two big clubs getting knocked out in the group stage. I think there's going to be two huge clubs getting knocked out, two surprises that we'll be talking about for a while. The nature of this compact schedule is worrying, but for us, the football fan, for us who live and breathe the beautiful game, it's just great to be a part of this and follow this competition every single step of the way um, with CBS and, and all of the people that will be talking about this competition with this season. I'm so excited. And I think we're going to see some cracking games, some crazy results, some high score lines, some shocking games as well. I think the Champions League this year is going to bring it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, fingers crossed that it's as unpredictable as it was in our first season back in 2020 when I had the very strange experience of having two French teams advancing all the way to the semi-finals. So I can but hope uh, the, that we have Ligue 1 represented that well on the continental stage. We'll see how it all pans out. We're looking forward to bringing it all to you guys on Kegolesso and on Paramount+. Plus. So looking forward to this week. Once again, thanks to James Benj and Ian Paul Joy. And that's all for us. Until next time, it's goodbye. Bye.